Greetings, everyone. My name is Anita Bates. I'm an artist and educator and curator for Into the Open, currently on view at the Detroit Artist Market. When the Detroit Artist Market staff asked me to be guest curator, I wanted to put together an exhibition of work from artists whose voices needed to be heard more. With me today is one of the seven artists from Into the Open, Mara Magarosi Leitner. Mara and I became acquainted several years ago while I was working in the secondary education arena at Henry Ford Academy School for Creative Studies, now U Prep Art and Design. The school was introduced in 20, uh, 2009, rather, as the brainchild between the Henry Ford Learning Institute and the College for Creative Studies. Mara began, um, we began our relationship when Mara was a student and then she um, joined our educational community as a teacher. And we have been friends and colleagues ever since. So I'm fortunate to have been able to watch her career grow in these tremendous ways. And I'm so happy that she's able to be here this evening to share some of her talent with you today. Mara, welcome. Thank you, Anita. I'm very excited to be here as well. So I am so glad you're here. And I've given kind of a cursory introduction, but please tell our viewers some more about you, your background, where you've exhibited, general themes about your work, all of that good stuff. Okay, um, so I am an artist and an educator, and I primarily focus in photography and alternative processes. Um, I'll explain a little bit more about that later. I um, am from the Detroit area. I grew up in one of the suburbs, and I've basically taught and in, in, um, either went to school and taught within Detroit or exhibited within Detroit for really the past 15 years or so. Um, but over the past year, I've also started exhibiting outside of the city and uh, started pushing my work more nationally and internationally. Um, my work themes uh, have been, uh, are generally speaking around the idea of, um, they have been traditionally about anxiety disorders, but also about identity and personal growth through a very poetic lens. So I uh, tend to focus in abstraction, um, but then also I'm pushing the boundaries of that. And uh, I draw a lot of my uh, references and influences from historical, uh, like historical photography as well as contemporary photography. And I love the idea of mixing both, um, both historical and contemporary to find my own path. Okay, great. So when I initially settled on work for Into the Open, and I shared this with you, I initially had six artists because I didn't want to have a lot of visual noise, right? But then when I laid everybody's work out and I started looking at it, I kept thinking, gosh, there's something that's missing. I need one more person. I need something. And it was kind of serendipitous that you happened to either call me or something happened. We were texting or something. And I said, wait a minute. I think this is a sign. So I kept hearing this voice saying, just ask Mara for her stuff. Tell Mara, you know, to bring, to give, give you some of her stuff. And then I uh, called the people at the artist market and said, hey, I'm going to add another artist. So um, I am really, really impressed with what has been going on in your life artistically, Mara, um, especially since you have uh, your, your near completion, right? With your work at SCAD, okay, with your MFA. On that MFA. Yep. Wonderful, wonderful. So I'm gonna have you talk about the impact of getting an MFA in a second, but can we look, let's, ha let's have a look at some of this growth journey that you've been on. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Here, let me share my screen so I can show you um, what my previous work looked like. So when I first started, um, back when uh, I first started teaching at UPAD, I started this series called Hyperstimulation. And it was a, uh, a body of work that was about the idea of visual hyperstimulation, which is what happens in the first 15 minutes or so before some people have a panic attack. Um, and what it what happens is that you get something called visual noise and colors shift, things change. Um, you can't trust your vision. And um, 
this was important to me because I have anxiety disorder and this is uh, one of the symptoms that I had. And as always, I, um, when I come across a problem that's happening with me, I like to solve it through my art or figure out some kind of solution through it. So I started making work that, um, although obviously an exaggeration of what it looks like, <laughs> is is pretty similar to what it looks like so things things will shift things will change colors will move um you can't quite trust your vision and as an artist this is an extremely in a way kind of horrific thing to be happening to you right because i didn't know what was going on and as a photographer a lot of times you have to be very color correct in what you're doing and so i started deciding to push the boundaries of of that of what I was making to depict what was happening to me. Because in a weird way, I couldn't really explain to people what was happening with me without some kind of visual uh, representation. So I made so many of these and I was showing them all over uh, Detroit and I showed them in a lot of different little, little places. I showed them at Our Detroit, I showed them at the Ferndale Public Library, I showed them at, um, uh, at, at the tangent gallery, I showed them at um, the Detroit Artist Test Lab. Like I was showing them often for that first uh, few years that I was working on them. And then finally, I ended up in this like culminating situation where uh, I was chosen for, as one of the semifinalists at the Bombay Sapphire Artisan Series. And we were showing at the Namdi uh, Contemporary Gallery. And I was so excited. I was so happy and so excited to be showing there. But one thing that's important to know about this work is this work was very tiny. So it was really intended to be shown in, in kind of grid patterns, the way that it's shown on my website in multiples together. So when I was showing them places, I was showing them 50 or so at a time. And when I got the piece in at Nambi, I only got one six by eight piece. So, um, the number one thing that I heard at the gallery that day was, Mara, we love your work, but we really wish it was bigger. So I started in, in my own little stubborn way, I started doing things in a slightly different way. So the first thing I did was just literally start nailing things together <laughs> because I was like, well, then I'll show them the way that they're intended to be. But also I started playing with this idea of gritting out work and putting work, um, installing it in larger in larger groupings, but intentionally installing them in those very, very much larger groupings, which I think leads us to where we're at now with mm -hmm. the work in general. So mm -hmm. this work is still from the hyper simulation series. This is when I was shooting these when I had the opportunity to take a trip to um, to Italy. And um, though the work was starting to grow and be bigger and I was still playing with those colors, but there hit a point um, photographically where I started, uh, stopped doing the color so much in post-processing and digitally and started actually making the color happen in, um, in the images themselves, which is what brings us to our current set of work and what we're showing, what I'm showing in Into the Open. Okay. Um, another interesting fun fact about this particular set of work is that at the time it was intended to be shown with 3D glasses because oh, yes, I remember <laughs> because um, what would happen, which I thought was really interesting when I discovered it, is that um, because they weren't um, they were double exposures, but they weren't true 3D ventricular images. So mm -hmm. when you put on the 3D glasses, your eye would skip between the two images and it would essentially overwhelm you and essentially mm -hmm. induce panic and anxiety in the viewer. Mm -hmm. And so I used that often to, um, to create empathy in the people who were viewing my work. And I would have these crazy conversations with people where they were, um, they would say, oh, you know, my son says they have anxiety disorder, but I don't know. I mean, whatever. And then they put on the glasses and they'd go, I need to go apologize to my kid and run away from my work. Mm. <laughs> and so um, I, I really liked the idea of using the work to, um, to generate empathy. So as you go through these, and I know we're going to get to the work um, that you have and in into the open, talk a little bit more about 
alternative process because I know for myself as a painter, I remember when you were doing these and I remember you, you know, this was a heavily a part of your curriculum, but I really couldn't get my head around it at first until I really witnessed you do it. Okay. So, um, I think one of the things that's important to remember about photography in general is that one, phot photography started off by a bunch of scientists. It wasn't mm -hmm. an art form at the start. And mm -hmm. um, over time, there's this conversation about whether or not photography is an art because of that idea of it not being one of a kind. The idea mm -hmm. of, oh, you can just make another one. Does that really mm -hmm. function as an art form? Mm -hmm. So when... Um, Alternative processes essentially solves that, not solves, but is an answer to that question because mm -hmm. what happens is, is that um, I take my photographs and I transfer the ink onto different sub uh, and onto different substrates. So I can transfer my work onto paper, onto glass, onto wood, onto plaster, onto all sorts of different things. Um, this particular image is transferred onto birch and then gold leaf is applied afterwards. Um, pretty much this whole group of work is all transferred onto birch. Um, and so that every single time that I move a photograph onto a piece of wood, it's slightly different. So even if I am transferring the same photograph more than once, there are differences in each one. The ink doesn't all land the same way. Some things end up more painterly. There's more brush strokes in areas. And so because of that, it makes it so that they are more one of a kind. Um, there's, a, there's a word for that, right? Uh, I'm blanking, but I'll, I'll come back to that later. As far as like in, in the contemporary photography world, they're starting to talk about that within the idea of like, if you have an addition of work, now they're talking about making multiples of like a transfer process of the same image. And is that considered an addition or not? Or are those considered one of a kind? And so this is a, this is definitely the move, um, in contemporary photography right now, beyond a photograph just being on your screen or living on a piece of paper, but is it considered an object and how that object works in space? Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing that set of work. Okay. Then we can move into what we, the new stuff. Okay. So as we move into that, Talk about, because I, I, you know, as a person who has an MFA, I understand that process. And, you know, for those people who are listening and don't know, an MFA, a Master of Fine Arts, is a terminal degree that one gets um, in fine art. So can you talk about your journey and, uh, or why, why did you start the MFA and how has this helped your work to transform? So... Um, <laughs> so Anita and I had a lot of conversations about this before I started the MFA process where I would literally talk in circles and go, I don't need an MFA. I'm making work anyway. I have a robust studio practice. I'm constantly showing like, why, why would I need an MFA? Right. And she would always just kind of laugh. <laughs> she would always just kind of laugh and be like, okay, yeah, whatever you want to do. Right. And, um, but it actually took me going, uh, I had the opportunity a few years ago to go down to the Savannah College of Art and Design as an, as an educator. Um, I won a um, free um, experience as a part of their um, educator forum. And so I was able to take classes there, just, just stay there for a week, stay in the dorms, take classes, do the whole thing, right? And it was really interesting for me because I got to take an experimental photography class, which this work started in. Um, and this experimental photography or photography class was all darkroom pace based. I got to be in a darkroom again, which I hadn't been in a few years. And there was just something about being around a lot of people who knew what I was talking about wow. that just mm -hmm. felt really different. Right. Um, there's it's, they often say like, you don't want to be the smartest person in a room. And when it came to photography in most spaces, I was the smartest person in the room that I was in because 
I was in rooms where not very many people knew about photography. And so it was really eye opening for me to go into SCAD who have, they have 20 photo professors across all of the programs. It's one of the largest photography departments in the United States. And see like a, a school that takes photography really seriously. And, and then it was interesting too, because when I was there, you know, uh, SCAD offers a scholarship for educators. That's it's, um, a half off scholarship for every, for teachers, because the head of SCAD, um, was a teacher before she started the school. And so they, you know, they have these conversations with people like, Hey, maybe you want to start, you know, maybe you want to do this or whatever. And they kept discouraging everybody from going in the photo department because they said, Mm. listen, the photo department is dead serious. You can't just go in the photo department and think you're going to take a couple classes and just slide through and get a degree. That's not how they work. And when I heard that, I went, Oh, they're my people then. Right. So I, um, so when I started the process, um, so, so this work in particular, um, I, during this experimental photo class, I was, um, going through, uh, they were talking about like different ways of using the enlargers and different ways of doing things photographically. And we didn't have, um, cameras there or print or printing things there. Like I had my digital camera, but I didn't have ways to make like digital negatives necessarily. And so I was thinking like, how can I make work with the enlargers in the dark room without actually taking photographs? Right. So I was walking through the streets in Savannah and I started collecting plants and I actually shoved all the plants inside of the enlarger and made these exposures onto the paper, literally just shining through the leaves and flowers of these plants. So what's, what's interesting about these is they're all, they were all the, the original print that was made was all completely one of a kind because there's no way to re to replicate that motion again. Right. Mm -hmm. They, you know, once the plants were on there and whatever I did with them, that was it. And I pulled them out. There wasn't a way to put it back in the same way. Right. So I sat on that set of work for a a minute. I, I took all that work and I, I put it in a folder and I just kind of left it. Um, and then I started my process of going to my classes at SCAD, which I'm doing remotely. And, I was working on the hyper stimulation work at the beginning and they basically were like, Hey, you already did this. It's time to move on. Right. Which was a little hard for me to hear. <laughs> and, um, so I started, <laughs> so I started, uh, playing with experimenting and really leaning into experimentation, which led me to when I, uh, had the opportunity to be a part of the artist, um, uh, residency at the siren Detroit, the summer of 2020. So, Mm -hmm. um, and that was through Sarah Ayers, uh, was the curator for that. And we, Mm -hmm. she was choosing artists to stay at the hotel because it was during the beginning of COVID and they didn't have anybody staying in the hotel. So they would let each artist stay at the hotel for a week for free and just make work, just do whatever you wanted. So when I first got there, I, um, was sitting in the lobby and was looking at this work. I had scanned it and put it on my computer and they were all originally just black and white. And when I was looking at this work, I started matching the colors to the colors that were in the lobby. And that's how the work was made. Oh, wow. They're so wonderful. And this is what we, um, you have this, this particular installation at the Detroit Artist Market near the window. And it really is such a phenomenal piece. It's beautiful here on screen, but people really can't appreciate it until they get up close and personal with it. Um, It's such a gorgeous, such gorgeous work. So just well done. Well done. Thank you. And they're, and they, those are each also transferred onto Birch uh, at 16 Mm -hmm. by 20 size. So this is why like I started moving things a little bigger, obviously. And I, I like the idea of doing these larger installations and showing the work um, in these grids as they're intended, but also like if somebody, you know, breaking things apart if they need to, or how things, um, mm-hmm. how different formations also look. So then um, also while I was there, 
I, uh, I went over to the belt and to the Z lot and I was doing this set of work called a lack of control, which I started doing around my house. And what I was doing was, is I was shooting through glass. Um, I was using this, uh, this tool called uh, the Lens Baby Omni System, which is essentially crystals that you're holding in front of your camera in different like mm. formations. So all oh, wow. of the work from a lack of control is the colors are correct from in camera. This was not digitally done in, in as far as like color correction or changing or mm -hmm. shifting the light. Um, this was, I was holding different colors of crystals and I was recording the reflections that were happening. And oh, wow. this- and this all came from the idea of um, during one of my conversations with some of faculty, when I was talking about shooting for anxiety disorders and talking about like the previous project where how I was shooting that visual hyperstimulation, one of them made a comment that I didn't necessarily appreciate, but one of them made a comment that was like, yeah, but that's in your head and that's not something that anyone else can see and that's not real and photographers shoot things that are real. And mm. I was like, okay, wow. I, have a, I have a lot of responses to that. Right. But, um, I felt like photographers shoot things a lot all the time that aren't exactly the way that it looks in real life. So I started wanting to show those visual flares and different things mm -hmm. that are happening um, through photography, not through a post-process like edited kind of way, but shooting in a way that shows like, yeah, even though this isn't what you naturally see, there are ways to shoot this in a way that's real. Okay. And that's what this came from. These are, um, these are much larger. Uh, each one of those panels is 16 by 24. So there's each of these, like, so these are three together. Um, so the panels are, yeah. So 24 tall by 48 across. Mm -hmm. So they're, so they're much larger. Um, and it's probably at the, at least for me, at least at this point, I haven't quite figured out how to go much larger than that. As far as transfer processes go, because transfer processes are, are a wet process and mm -hmm. your solution will dry at a certain point while you're moving the ink. And so, well, you know, you, know you have to get an assistant now. <laughs> you're funny. <laughs> <laughs> So yes, I don't have an assistant. I do everything by myself. I'm literally sitting in my studio right now. This is, this is where the magic happens. So. Okay. And this, well, these are some of my favorite ones um, because they do have such a presence on the wall, but also, um, and I, I, again, I encourage people to uh, see this as soon as they can, um, but and to follow you and your work, but it, it lends itself. It has that um, industrial elegance that Detroit has. So I think that, you know, it fits very well at the Detroit artist market. So while we thank you so much for showing, for sharing your inner self and your uh, work with us. And before we go, before we wrap up, tell us what's next for you. Where's the next exhibition? What do you have in the works? I, um, I have a lot of things in the works. So over the past year, uh, I have jokingly called the past year, the summer of spice, the year of spice, because mm -hmm. I went from not, I went from showing a lot around Detroit to then the pandemic happening and not really showing too much at all to all of a sudden showing all over the place. So, okay. um, last year I had shown, um, in Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota and Wichita, Kansas. I had work in Italy. I had worked through the Texas Photographic Society. Um, I'm probably missing. So I had uh, work at Patch and Remington in Marcellus, Michigan mm -hmm. um, with Sarah Ayers again. Um, and so things have been definitely getting like a lot of things are kind of happening. And so right now I have work, I have two pieces in a show um, called Feminine Masculine at the PH21 Gallery in Budapest, Hungary. I won oh, wow. on a for one of the pieces. Um, I also have a few pieces in a, um, a show through Shutter Hub, which is called Your Body Belongs to You, that's being shown in April on the coast of France. Um, okay. 
there's a, my MFA thesis present or er, uh, exhibition is coming up called The Untended Garden. And that is gonna be happening at the Cedar House Gallery on April 1st in Savannah, Georgia. Um, oh, wow. And then okay. eventually may move up here depending on what, you know, what goes on with that. Um, and then I also, um, so also through my time at SCAD, I uh, started an artist collective of um, nine women uh, photographers that were making work um, that are all fine art um, photographers across the United States and Canada. And so our first um, exhibition called Sterling Presence is going to be at Gallery uh, 1313, which is a part of the Contact Photography Festival in Toronto, Ontario. Oh, wow. um, and that is uh, in May. But the Contact okay. Photography Festival is one of the largest uh international photography festivals in the world so it's very really? like super duper exciting um we're really excited and then there's other stuff that's happening too that's kind of like laying low but those that's okay. all the stuff i can kind of announce right now okay that's a lot that's I a know. lot i'm I so proud and know. happy for your successes <laughs> well you. thank you so much mara for joining us and before we depart i'd like to say a big thank you again to the Detroit Artist Market for helping to bring um, this wonderful group of women to Detroit audiences. Thank you so much. And uh, Into the Open closes February 19th. Please be sure to see it if you have not already done so. And if you have, see it again. Okay, this is Anita Bates and Mara Magarosi-Leitner signing off. Bye-bye. Thank you.